we're going to build a graph. We want to draw on concepts of knowledge graphs, call this event knowledge graph, because they build it from event data. I'm going to analyze it. The idea is to don't do the mistake of the first one. So we're not going to pick a case identifier. Rather, we take the identifier, entity identifiers that are there, and then for each event, we first identify all the related entities, and then order the events per entity. Simple principle. Ah, now you got to work because I'm letting you do this. Ah. So let me go. Here we are. So I just told you the principle, right? So for each event, we have to find out what are the entities related to it. And then we model this as a graph. Let me give you a starting point for building this. I create for each event an event node. Very simple. So um, I create a node, E5, create a node, E9. Uh, I give this the label event, and I give it all kinds of attributes, all the attributes that you see in the, in the table. I have uh, another event, E18, and then I have uh, E29, and I have E30. So these are all event nodes. Now, what are the entities that are related to, let's say, E30? R5 definitely is an entity. We're going to skip over that one. We'll come back to the, uh, to the actor later. So uh, but it definitely is an entity. So if we leave the actor out, I won. So I'll draw I1 over here. And this is an entity node, right? And it kind of give it also the, the, the type. So this is an, this is an invoice. What else? P1, definitely. It's another, it's another entity. P1, move this over here. P1, entity node, and I2. And to encode that an event is correlated to an entity, we just draw an edge. All right, now I've modeled event E30 correlates to I1, I2, and P1. If my handwriting would be better, you could actually read it. What about E29? What do I have to do to complete this graph for E29? Just draw an edge lead to P1. But I can do the same thing for E18, right? I draw an edge to I1. There's also O1 for uh, E18, right? So it's also over here. And uh, E9 uh, is correlated to I2. And E5 is also correlated to I2 and also to O2. So that's the structure events that are correlated to entities. Now we add behavior, behavior dimension. We now look at each entity node, look at all the events that are connected to it and order them by time. Then we add an edge between two subsequent events. So which edges should I draw? Which edges that order events should I draw based on this principle? So if I look at I1, within the same entity. So I1 correlates to E18 and E30. 
So I draw an edge. There's nothing else, right? There, there are no other events. So I draw an edge from E18 to E30. Call this the directly follows edge. You can also label it. It's for entity I1. And notice how it skips over E29, right? Because E29 is not correlated to I1. It's not, not part of it. So the edge doesn't go there. If I do this for E5, uh, for I2, then I have an edge from E5 to E9, and from E9 to E30. And last one from E29 to E30 is for payment one. So now I've materialized local traces from the perspective of each entity. Right? I don't have a trace for the entire order. I have small local traces for each entity. And they meet here in E30 because that's where the two invoices are paid by payment one. And apart from that, they're kind of disjoint. They do their own thing, they're local. Okay, so if we do this, so these are all the steps that I uh, just did with you on the slides. Then I get an event knowledge graph. Call it event knowledge graph because it's using the property graph model that's used in knowledge graphs. Well, it's one kind of knowledge graph. And we're using property graphs because it allows us to model paths. A query path. I can. Well, we have a path here, right? For this, uh, for this invoice too. These are the traces we like so much in process analysis. So here is this event knowledge graph for this data that uh, I made up for this process. What do you see in this uh, in this graph? In this event knowledge graph. What structures can you see that you find interesting? Yeah. We see something interesting in here. This is massive, so it takes a bit of time. Batching, yes, absolutely right. So we have batching again. Multiple items being put into a shipment. Batching is there. That's good. What else do you see? Yeah. Sorry, this was a bit too loud from there. Can you say it again? Yeah, that's right. Right. So I have as many unpack events over here as I have uh, have items because I'm performing this local to each to each item. Right. So each item individually is unpacked and 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 looked at. And then split. E E five E five or E five? No. There. You mean E six here, right? Five. Let me let me go down to E5. Um, yeah. So this is an end split, right? So it's 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 actually it's it's the same thing. E5 and E6, right? So so you have an event like E5 where O2 goes on, right? The the order is being continuously handled, but then I have this new object in this. So I have an end split in here. Actually, all double incoming outgoing are are end splits. Well, it is an end split in the sense that we have two concurrent things that kind of meet or, or, or split off. My personal opinion is that whenever we do model parallelism in BPMN, something like this is behind it. You don't do things in parallel unless you're kind of splitting up the process into two things, whether that's physical objects or information objects, doesn't matter. But there is some connection, something spawns off or kind of meets at some point. Yeah, so we see 
And we see two kinds of end splits or kind of, so the end splits are where, where things are created, right? So I'm getting a new object in there. Here, this, this end split, I'm, it's not really creating the items because the items have been there before. They just come into my scope of observation. So if I would have been data from the su su supplier, shipment company, I would maybe see more what has happened to these items before that. I can do that. I have the data. Well, then there's one very obvious thing that uh, that you see is we now can see how the supplier orders and the customer orders are related to each other because we see these items here kind of synchronizing the two. Also, the two supplier orders are completely concurrent, independent. You don't see any edge between them at least regarding information flow. There's probably much more to see in here. So what I want to get across here with this part is that um, these structures are different from what we're used to, and it takes time to study them. And I think there's many, many interesting things to observe, patterns to look for, to conceptualize, to make it, to make it easier.